I'm going to be actually more specific and talk about the broken educational system. I want to be clear. I'm not going to talk about the US um, educational system. There's a lot of conversations going around. I want to focus on the educational system that most countries in this um, world follow, and they've been following for over 200 years. And that's actually one of the problems. We've been following this educational system that was founded on a time and an environment that doesn't exist anymore. So with that said, I'm going to actually rephrase my topic, and I'm going to talk about the absolute educational system that we have. Now, it's still a pretty broad subject to cover in 20 minutes or under, so I'm going to try to focus on why. I'm going to just list basically facts about what we know of our educational system, what we know about what, how kids learn, and I'm going to focus sort of also in the area of the public education and children. Here is an image from the University of Bologna in Italy. This is from the 1300s. This is basically, basically a classroom. We have the teacher, we have the textbook that they use, and we have a bunch of students talking to each other, um, taking notes, probably using the same textbook as the, the teacher. And we also have the guy sleeping in the back of the classroom. So <laughs> nothing has changed <laughs> in over 700 years. All right, so a little bit of history. Hopefully, I'll keep it really, really simple. So our current educational system was created in the late 1700s, early 1800s. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and also following the circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. The problem with Enlightenment is that they were trying to challenge the vision of the time, right? Mainly dictated by the church and their educational system that they had on the time. So they focus a lot on science um, and philosophy to try to challenge the status quo of the time. Um, and at the same time, we had one of the major uh, turning points in history, the Industrial Revolution. So these two play the mo um, play an important role, if not basically we define everything in our, in our current educational system based on these two factors. So I'm going to take each one of them and just go really quickly over what they represented. Like I said, so enlightenment was developed to challenge the dogma and church of teaching of the day. They focus on science, scientific methods, and philosophy. And more importantly, this uh, point here is, it was driven by the model of the mind, the academic ability. Basically, it means that if you're a good and academic, you're smart. If not, you're not smart. And that right there represents one of the biggest problems that we have right now in the educational system. We focus on science and philosophy, uh, so math, uh, languages, etc., and we live behind arts and humanity. Um, and so we focus on one side of the brain, we forget our bodies, and we focus on the head and one side of the brain. Then we also have the Industrial Revolution. Basically, back in those days, um, one of the needs was to create a set of professionals with identical skills. They actually needed to create identical people, per se. They, they needed to be able to take one person in one country, ship him over to a different um, country, and make sure that he was able to function the same way. Um, the Industrial Revolution also happened when British, the British Empire was at their um, prime time. It, was the, it is, or it was, the biggest empire it has ever existed. Back in the day, they didn't have computers, no cell phones, no cars, no planes. So they needed to make sure that they were able to govern all of the territory that they um, have conquered using simple ships to communicate. So they created the bureaucratic administrative machine, an awesome machine. It was basically a worldwide computer of people. And therefore, that's where lies the importance to create an identical people. They had to have um, great skills to read and do multiplication, division, um, addition, subtraction. Those were the needs of the time. Um, then 
the Industrial Revolution basically model how schools were created. Basically, our schools are a factory um, where we batch kids through the assembly line, where the most important piece is age. We care about how old they are. We don't care about anything else. We put them through the assembly line based on age. Uh, we divide the schools and subjects and by facilities just the same way we do in factories. We even still use uh, ring bells to split the time that kids spend on different areas, just like factories. So as you can see so far, everything that our schools are based on, it was on a time that doesn't exist anymore, and an environment that doesn't apply anymore. Um, we know, and I'll show you here in a second, our kids don't learn this way, right? Not all kids at a certain age are good at everything. There are some kids that are good at different things, better than others. They learn better at different times of the day. Maybe they're better at the mornings, better in the afternoons. Um, but we continue using this process that is not broken because we continue saying that our broken educational system and we need to reform it, we need to change it. It's not broken. It was actually, it's a beautiful system that's been working for 200 years. But that's the problem. We need to, we need to change it. It's an obsolete uh, system. So what do we do nowadays? Another thing we do is we focus on standardization. We keep saying all of our kids, if we, if we, if we were to measure how smart they are based on these guidelines from 200 years ago, we need to standardize testing. We can do that. We shouldn't be doing it. Unfortunately, our system is based completely on this um, fact. Now, we also have um, subject ranking, right? As I mentioned before, we focus basically almost in this order and math uh, mathematics, languages, humanity, then arts. Actually, even within arts, we split them and certain subjects become more important than others. Um, like maybe music is more important than dancing, etc. And we have a problem. I mean, we know we have a lot of problems. So, but one of them is also academic inflation. Too many kids. That that not that they go through colleges. Maybe they were not supposed to go at that point. Maybe they they were not even meant to go to college. Um, our degrees are not worth what they were worth before. Now you need a master's when you just needed a, a bachelor's. Now you need a PhD when you need a master's. So what's next? Are we going to have to create a new level? Uh, or do you need PhDs or just to be able to perform the jobs that um, were not required? So big problem. Um, and most of the laws that we're trying to apply right now to reform an educational system, mechanism on rules, on how to teach kids. We actually take a lot of the ability from teachers to teach their kids. We're telling the teachers how to do their jobs, as opposed to saying, go and do it, do your best, and we'll support you. We're actually trying to tell them how to do it. So teaching is all about learning. If kids are not learning, then why are we teaching them? Right? We have a lot of kids. Uh, a lot of kids we have actually alienated a lot of kids, um, millions, who do not conform to our policies and education. And we have forgotten that kids have an enormous capacity for innovation. They are actually really good at it. Uh, there has been tests of, um, around um, how it's more, how creative they are. Not so as how smart, but how creative they are. And so they did this test on kindergarten kids. And based on their, and their um, standards that they set out for the testing, um, there was a, a level of genius. And 98% of kids in kindergarten are geniuses in divergent thinking. 98%. They tested the same group of kids five years later. Less than 50% now made it to the genius level. They tested them again five years later it was lower than 15%. So apparently our educational system is actually taking kids from being creative, innovative, and put them in this, again, assembly line where we teach them how they're supposed to learn. We tell them what they need to learn. 
And we tried to standardize that system to make sure that every single kid is identical. Intelligence is diverse, dynamic, and distinct. So why are we trying to standardize the process if we know it's diverse and it's dynamic and every kid is unique? We have also learned through different studies, and I'll show an example here shortly, that learning is a self-organizing system. You can actually have a group of kids teaching each other without the intervention of an adult. And they've learned a lot. The human nature is, I wanna, I, I'm, cur I'm curious, right, it's curiosity. That's, we, we're born with that. Yet it seems that once we put them into our educational system and the schools, they grow out of it. Actually, Picasso once said that we are all artists. The problem is to stay an artist as we grow up. So the human um, life principles of, uh, to flourish are actually based on humans are naturally different and diverse. We are curious and we are inherently creative. There is a professor in New Delhi, and you have probably heard about this, um, this experiment that he did called the hole in the wall. And I'm going to show with this quick uh, um, example how he covered the previous three points. Basically what he did one day, he decided to uh, put a computer in the hole of the wall uh, next to his school. Uh, there was a slum next to the school. He was intrigued by all these comments about the parents saying, oh, my kids are so smart, they're learning computer, look how smart he is. And he's like, so all these rich people are intelligent, so what happened to the poor kids? You know, I'm like, are they dumb? You just like, what's going on? So he set up this computer, he put it on the wall. Um, you know, several kids were watching while he was setting it up and they asked him, you know, what is this? And he said, um, I don't know, um, can I touch it? And he said, well, if you wish to. And he went away, didn't say anything. He didn't tell him it was a computer and explain how to use it, nothing. He just walked away. Eight hours later, he came back. The kids have taught themselves how to browse and how to use some of the basic stuff of the computer. It was a Windows computer, by the way. <laughs> uh, they were already teaching on that. <laughs> um, with an apple. <laughs> um, and so he went back to one of the professors and said, hey, look. Look what the kids did. And one of the professors, several professors said, well, most likely, uh, it makes, and it makes sense, one of your students came by and taught him how to use the computer. And he was like, okay, it's possible. So he took the concept to a remote area um, over 200 kilometers from New Delhi, um, where kids have never seen a computer before, again. Um, and he set up again the, the same thing again, uh, just a computer on, on, on the wall. And again, he just walked away and came back two months later. And he did this again and again and again in different locations, completely remote, where the chance of a student walking by basically was zero. Right? There was no, nobody was going to help them how to set it up. Anyways, so findings of this experiment is the 6 to 13-year-old kids taught themselves how to do browsing, uh, basic Windows operations, painting, chatting and email, games and educational material, music downloads, and playing video games on the computer. This without the kids knowing English at all. They didn't know anything about the computers, not even the language. The kids actually, he started testing the kids, you know, like, okay, what else do you learn? He noticed learning two or 200 words of English while teaching themselves how to use the computer. There's actually a um, really, um, emotional uh, piece for me in one of the videos that I saw where a little um, girl, so one of the times he comes back and says, what did you learn? He said the, he said the computer basically with biotech documentations, you know, to see if the kids were curious and open them and trying to read them. The documents again were in English, the kids didn't um, read English. And came back two months later and so he, they asked him, what did you learn? And they're like, oh, nothing. And he's like, okay, so how long it took you to, you know, to give up? Bef you know, because you were not learning anything. They're like, oh, we haven't given up. We're still learning. Every day we come, we, we come here and we try to learn more. And then one of the girls said, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes disease, we haven't found anything else. 
She, <laughs> she just memorized the phrase, right? I mean, so this is, this basically summarizes um, what I've been trying, you know, what I've been saying here for the last 15 minutes is we are creative. We are different. We can teach each other. Um, so where do we go from here? I don't know. I, I on purpose, didn't want to talk about that. Um, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about how to do it. Um, but I just wanted to show you guys, um, hopefully it will spark um, in your minds that we need to change education. Um, I don't have the credentials to say how we want to do it, but it's really important. Our future is not clear. To teach our kids right now, we're trying to prepare our kids for our future, and we don't even know what that future is. We know that we can continue doing it the same way we've been doing it for 200 years, and that we need to change it. With that, um, as I said before, the whole point of education is to learn. If we're not learning, then what the heck are we doing? And that's it.